Greetings, children of the God of love, who is always with us in our crucibles. Today, we are focusing on the title, The Bird Cage. We are going to look at two significant themes that summarize our lesson. The first theme reads, God leads us through the struggles of this fallen world. While this comforts us, it also gives us strength, zeal, and confidence in our God. The second theme reads, it is only when God leads us through the battles of our life that we grow and are transformed. I have also leading questions that we would want answered as we go through our lesson. The first question, would God himself actively take part in guiding us into crucibles where we experience confusion, fear, and hurt? Question number two. If God does, why would he do that? The last question, does God tempt his children or is God a tempter? Mrs. White, in the book, The Ministry of Healing, lays a foundation to our understanding of our lesson by giving us a symbolism of a caged bird. The master of the caged bird wants to teach the bird a song, but there are noises and visual distractions outside. So what does he do? He decides to cover the bird, the cage where the bird is, and take the bird to a quieter place where the bird vigorously learns the song. After having mastered the song in darkness, the bird is brought out to light. And now it can sing the song for the rest of its life. God wants to teach us a song. In the middle of the shadows of all the various afflictions, God is saying, my children, I want you to learn a song. He uses dark and unpleasant circumstances sometimes on papers because he has a song he wants us to learn. Take the example of a teacher in the classroom. In order to help the students pass, he or she should study the learning environment and see if it is conducive to learning. He removes all the distractions around his learners. He removes everything that can prevent effective learning. Different forms of punishment may be executed in order for the learners to excel. At times, the students might be spanked a little bit just to be reminded that they must concentrate. At times, they may be grounded and be told not to go for lunch or not to go for break. It's not that the teacher hates the learners. The teacher looks at the end. The teacher wants the children to learn and pass. The grades, a better grade, is what the teacher wants. Let's go home. At home, parents, Guardians, at times, they spank the children when they misbehave, when they steal a little bit of sugar there, or they make a lot of noise in church. Do they hate their children? No, they don't hate them. What are they doing? They are molding characters so that they are good boys and girls, so that even if they learn or they grow up, they are responsible people. This is exactly what God does with his children too. 
So at times, he disciplines us, not because he hates us, but because he wants perfect characters. Let us draw some lessons from the experiences of the children of Israel on their way to Canaan. We are also going to look at Jesus in the wilderness and learn some good lessons from there. When you go to the book of Exodus, chapter 14, we find a narration there. A trap the Israelites found, found themselves in. Remember, God is leading them through the pillar of cloud during the day and of fire in the night. So he has led them to this place where there's a sea in front, mountains both on both sides, and there's a massive army of Pharaoh right behind. God has led his children to a dead end. Where do they go? Fear struck them, and they cried out to the Lord. If you read Exodus chapter 14, it tells us that fear struck them. But one good thing about the children of Israel, they cried to the Lord. Even today, Christians of today, when we encounter unpleasant, fearsome circumstances, let us cry to the Lord. But why did God lead the children of Israel to a dead end? What was he teaching them? And what is he teaching us today? Number one, we learn that following the pillar or following God does not guarantee a smooth life always. It also can be hard experience. Just being a Christian, it also can be hard experience. But what is soothing is that Jesus says, have faith in me. When we turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 2, sorry, chapter 43, verse 2, God says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not be drowned. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. God is actually saying, I will be with you in those crucibles. When we go to Exodus chapter 14, verse 31, we hear that the people of Israel put their faith in the Lord after they had experienced the mighty hand of God, which protected them from the army of Pharaoh. The journey still continues. They have not yet reached Canaan. They are moving. After their Red Sea encounter, God led them to another dark room, the Raphidim hot desert experience. For three days, they stayed without water. And from there, God led them to another experience, the Mara experience. They found water. They, they saw water, and what a relief. I, I could also have seen that. When I saw water, I would jump and say, what a relief. Thank you, Lord, for the water. But alas, it was bitter water. I can visualize the disappointment. The disappointments written on their faces. What, a, what else, God? What is it now? You have given us water, but water is bitter. It never rains. It was actually pouring. Yes, the journey is not yet over. God is still molding their characters. God still wants them to trust him. So, what does God do at times? At times, we do not get from God everything we want. That is a very good lesson as Christians. We don't get everything that we have asked for, even through 
prayer and fasting. But what is comforting is that God is still leading them by the pillar of cloud. God is still in the forefront. Yes, he leads them to another place. He gives them water and they drink the water. So God at times answers our prayers. I'm sure there are people who can testify that I prayed and God answered my prayer. Let's go to another interesting, another interesting scenario. We find Jesus in the wilderness. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Something about temptations. Temptations can be so difficult because they appeal to the things we desire. And they always seem to come at our weakest moments. Jesus had fasted for 40 days and he was hungry. He was at his weakest. And what happens? The devil comes. He pounces and he comes with a solution. If you want food, you can turn these stones. But what did Jesus do? He resisted the devil. And he pointed the devil to the scriptures. Even after fasting and praying as Christians, we can still experience pain. We can still experience hurt and affliction and even unanswered prayers. Why? Because there are lessons that God wants us to learn. Why? Because God is teaching us a song. But the question still stands. Does God lead us into temptations? God never tempts us. Let's go to James chapter 1, verse 18. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to, to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. So, if God doesn't tempt us, so what is this whole issue about temptations? God does lead us to crucibles of testing. His leading in these trials helps us to exercise our freedom. He, it helps us to grow in love and commitment to him. We also grow in our understanding of him and we also understand ourselves. When we overcome temptations, we understand ourselves. James chapter 1 verse 3 advises us. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. God led the children of Israel to a trap at the Red Sea, not to allure them to sin, but to help them, help them to grow in their trust and love for him as individuals. Let's look at the young man, Alex. Alex gave himself to God after a past which was infested with drug abuse. Life never was pleasant for him. He experienced a plethora of crucibles, one after another. He could not understand why, especially because he was sure that the Lord had led him to school. Why? His whole experience with God, is it a huge mistake? No, 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 no. It's not a mistake. He just needed to trust God. It is comforting to know that when we crumple under temptation, we can hope again because Jesus stood and endured temptation. Because Jesus went through a crucible, worse than any of us will ever face, we are not forsaken by God. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, assures us, and he says, all who are battling in and through various forms of crucibles, those who are experiencing grief in all kinds of trials, including you and me, these trials 
are not an accident. They are designed to prepare us for eternity that awaits us when Jesus Christ returns. Mrs. White has this to say. Of old, the Lord led his people to refeed him. He may choose to lead us there also, to test our loyalty. He longs to manifest himself to us and to reveal the abundant supplies at our disposal. And he permits trial and disappointment to come to us so that we may realize our helplessness and learn to call upon him for aid. Our trials are not to be compared with the eternal weight of glory awaiting the overcomer. They are God's workmen, ordained for perfection of character. However great the deprivation and suffering of Christians today, however dark and unfathomable may seem the way of providence, the Christian is to rejoice in the Lord, knowing that all is working for good. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And I know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. In the future, we shall see how closely all our trials and crucibles were connected to our salvation. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you for the love that we have for us. Thank you, dear God, because even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will never leave us alone. You have promised that you are going to be with us right through the end of the world. You have promised that you will be with us in these tribulations and trials and help us, Father, to grow strong, to trust in you, and to always believe in your promises because these promises are sure. Help us to endure until you come to take us to a promised home that is free of pain and suffering. We pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.